unfolding the eternal excellences, the hidden insights of the truth, and the depth of the riches of wisdom and knowledge. The Bible says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have not pointed to your weaknesses. He says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have pointed to your strength. And this is your strength, that I am Christ in you, the hope of glory. The glory of freedom, the glimpses into eternity. The gospel is not supposed to be an assumption. It's not supposed to be just a mere presupposition. Truth is older than language. But the word of God is way deeper than any human language. And now, Apostle Grace with the word. Praise the Lord. The Bible says in John, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except a cone of wheat fall in the ground and die in the mighty of the Lord. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. I've had a very interesting experience. Uh, in studying both the Greek, the Hebrew, and the Aramaic partly. In the Aramaic, amazingly, I studied that scripture also from an Aramaic kind of translation. And I discovered that in the writing of the Bible, everywhere you see verily, verily. Yeah? When you see a repetition of verily, verily. Every time you see verily, verily. Always note in the back of your head that that's a timeless truth. Are you following me? There are truths that are for a given time. There are truths that are timeless. In other words, there are truths that are time-bound and there are truths that are not time-bound. There are things in the Bible or in Scripture that are still there but are not relevant to our time. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, but there are things in Scripture, in the Bible, that are relevant to our time. There are some in the Bible which, if I say, are not relevant to our time, I'm not saying that they are not profitable for doctrine. I'm only saying that their context might not be as applicable in this time as it was those days. You, you understand what I'm saying? For example, in the olden culture, when a woman died, they would used to pass her on to her brother <laughs> in the Jewish culture. You understand? That was happening then because of their numbers and many other factors. Now, it is not biblical teaching that when a man dies, they pass his wife to the brother. Is it applicable? But back in those days, it was a truth. You, you follow what I'm saying? But there are truths that are timeless. In other words, they existed, exist, and will always exist. They were relevant, are relevant, and will always be relevant. John 12, 24 is one of those timeless truths. Are you following me? He said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall in the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. Praise the Lord Jesus. So, already the principle of multiplication is very clear there. That if something is not yet dead, it abideth alone. It has to die. If it is not dead, the Bible says it is alone. Praise the Lord. It abideth alone. Put it in your own picture that if you're not dead, you abide alone. Okay, you'll understand it. When Jesus was walking the face of the earth before he died, he was alone. He was the only son of God who could give life. He was the only son of God who could give power. He was the only son of God who who understood God that way on the face of the earth. But when Jesus died, the multiplication effect happened. Now all of us here have Jesus in our hearts. Somebody shout hallelujah. hallelujah. But we have Jesus in our hearts because there was a point where he multiplied himself. And that multiplication had a precedence of death. If death does not take place, nothing truly multiplies. This is an aspect that works in every area of life. Some sort of death takes place that some sort of life will come through. Some of you who studied science many years ago, you remember the germination. Huh? Now let me speak from a more understanding perspective. The word germination comes from the word germ. G-E-R-M, right? So germination, determination, determination, right? Exam. Me nation. This is germy nation, right? A germ is a principal entity of life. That's what a germ is. 
Of course, many of us, when they were teaching us about germs, they only told us about negative germs, yeah? Their germs spread diseases. But really, the most intricate definition of a germ is that one small thing that has life. That's a germ. You understand? So germination is that process by which plants die and come to life, right? Now, what happens really, when you put a seed in the ground and plant it in the ground, when the Bible says that except it die, it's a science that actually the body of that seed dies. The body of that seed dies. Some people think that the seed is the body. You understand what I'm saying? When you hold a bean seed, uh, the real life in that seed is not the body you behold. You understand what I'm saying? So from today, every time you see a seed, understand that the real seed, the real life of that seed is not in what you see. No. What happens is that there's a principle of life, a germ inside that seed. right? And that germ cannot come out to grow except the body of that seed dies. That's how germination takes place. So it goes in the ground, the body goes in the ground, it decomposes, right? And then mixes with the materials of the ground. And when it mixes with the materials of the ground, the life in that seed comes up. And when that life in that seed comes out without a form, it starts to get a form and then starts to sprout out of the ground into the blade, into the, the shoot, into the ear. You understand what I'm saying? But the process is that the body has to shed off and die. That the real life of that seed comes through. It's amazing. It's so amazing. If you imagine that actually nothing of that body remains before the seed can become life. If I get a bean seed, right? For example, if I plant a seed in the right ground and give it the right nutrients to grow. If this seed does not grow, chances are that there is no life within it. For example, if I cook a seed, if I boil a seed, okay, the boiling of that seed, it might not even outwardly show that it is cooked. It might not, depending on how much degree of heat that I apply to it. But to the degree of heat applied to that seed is to the degree of how much life is killed within. You, you understand what I'm saying? Yet at one point, it will need that light, but not at the primary stage. At that particular point, the more the light, the more it will die. You understand what I'm saying? before it hits the ground. You understand? Because light emits heat. Isn't it? So, this seed goes in the ground, its body sheds off, its body decomposes, but in there, what you don't see is actually a life. And that life, the moment the body starts to shed off, that life starts to sprout out, and this thing now becomes a what? The plants that you see and then it bears branches, and then it bears uh, fruit. And that fruit starts to look like the seedling you put in, because the life defines the body that comes after. You understand what I'm saying? The life defines the body that comes after. Are you following me, somebody? The life defines the body that comes after. And God says, for as long as the earth remains, again I'm saying this is among the timeless truths, for as long as the earth remaineth seed and harvest, these are things that for the end up to the end of ages will remain. They are timeless. They existed and are relevant then. They exist and are relevant now and will exist and will be relevant in future. So if you don't understand this principle, it doesn't matter what you do in this life. You will never multiply like you ought. Let me give you an example of marriage. When people meet each other, they fall in love. And of course, many of them, their revelation at that particular point, I'll tell you, everybody at that particular point, except for the few cases where sometimes, for example, you're found in the Indian cultures where there's arranged marriages where you don't have the opportunity to know somebody, to get to talk to them and understand who they are, or some of the Eastern cultures, even into the Somali places, in a few places in, in the Islam world, Many of them, it's arranged marriages. Parents meet over parents and then they discuss the weaknesses, the strengths of their children. And then after that, they talk. And after talking, the guy says, I think my child is fit for yours. And then before you know that, they're telling the guy, we go to your wife. And he says, what? Yeah, we go to your wife. And then what happens? Tomorrow he meets her the first day. Hey, how are you? How are you doing? He's not meeting her to make a decision. No. He's meeting her because 
he must know who he's going to marry. And the next time they're going to marry. One of my mentors then in university was a man called Sharmanir Varghese. I met him. He had married his wife for 27 years. And he told me, Apostle, I met my wife the first time, the second time I was marrying her. He met her the first time. Just say, hi, you're the one I'm going to marry. Pleased to meet you. Then they met on the wedding day. And they've been happily married for 27 years. Some of you have dated for five years, six years. You even know each other's children. You know your family. You know everything. You're here. But somehow in the future, something funny happens. Those are few, few, few moments. But even in those moments, there is a process through which these people start connecting and having chemistry, sort of. Right? Chemistry is the art of reconciling things without language to explain them. It happens in everything. It even happens in a team game. You can find a team that has chemistry. You understand? Where for some random reason they get into the zone and the man knows where the other man is and he passes the ball without knowing. So it's that thing that brings a certain connection. I'm not talking about it. It's certain... There are also my funny perversive spirits that people call chemistry. Eh? They're just perversion. It's just a Jezebel thing. I'm not talking about that kind of thing. But the majority of people who get married, including also these, there's a process where they start to fall in love humanly, right? So they fall in love, you know, they fall in love, you know. Saturdays become hotter, you understand. They are loading data every time to talk. It happens. Now, at one point, of course, in that process of infatuation, the excitement eh, of being in love, some people think that it's going to be like that forever. You get my point? Some people even pray that it's going to be like that forever. But human love is temporal. Or, if it's not temporal, it's vacillating. It changes. You understand? She annoyed me. He spoke to me badly this morning. I'll not talk to him. Those good things happen between married couples. You understand? Eh? Then they give themselves silent treatment, loud treatment. You understand? <laughs> I don't know they heard of a story of a man and a woman who gave themselves each other silent treatment. So that guy, woke, one day he had an interview, very important interview. And then he was annoyed, but the, the wife was the only person who could wake him up. Alarm clocks don't work. So he wrote her a note, silent treatment, and he told her, wake me up at six, I have an interview. P.S. You have burned. Left it on the table. She saw it very well. At 6 a.m. in the morning, she came, got a pen, wake up. (laughs) Some people are wicked. (laughs) You understand? (laughs) Silent what? But infatuation has its time. You understand? And over time, as you mature in this relationship of marriage, you start to realize that deeper things define you than your feeling. You get my, you get my point? That's why we talk about purpose. Some find it before they marry. Some find it when they marry. Some never find it and their weddings and marriages will shake. You, you get my point? When you find purpose, you can't look at another person. How can you look at another person? How? Where can you find purpose with a strange person? You can't. You just can't. You, you see what I'm saying? You, you just can't. That's why the Bible speaks of, of adultery as one lacking judgment. Praise God. But do you understand what I'm saying? So, infatuation happens, you know. They feel for each other a certain way. And then... There's something in agape that also looks like that, but it's different. And I'm going to come to that a bit. You get my point? It also looks and feels like that human love, but this one is different. You understand what I'm saying? eh? This one is very clear. It is patient. It is kind. It vaunteth not itself. It behaves itself not unseemly. It believeth all things. It hopeth all things. It never fails. There's that one. But it also feels like this infatuation that people have, or... They, some used to call it what? Uh, puppy love. Those little high school kids who are dating each other and they are convinced they are going to marry each other. Then they chuck each other in four months. <laughs> At a particular point, these human feelings start to take certain shapes. And sort of infatuation starts to die slowly. You understand? You stop, sort of. Because when you meet this person... 
There are things about them you don't know. But when you start living with them, you know how they snore, you know how they... <laughs> Mixtures of things come through. Praise God. As these things happen, your attraction stops from... It starts to go beyond their, that person's body. You get it? Your attraction starts to go beyond what you see on them. It starts to go inside. Somehow, things outside start, will change. You, you understand, for example, p- women start aging, yeah? And then their belts start going up. Just happens. She looks different. The chicks go a bit a certain way. You understand what I'm saying? Over the years, you start to realize she was not the model you met in 1992. You get my point? And amazingly, the eyes that used to look at her that way die and you start to see the beauty within. And when you see that beauty within, she's still the mode of 1982, but not outwardly. Hello? Something at one point has to die to give way to the true definition. Human love continues to die in couples as agape is begotten. The true love of God starts to come out. Isn't it? You, you get my point? And that's how multiplication happens it could multiply in different aspects you understand it could uh, multiply in different aspects of your marriage you don't necessarily need to to build the numbers but it's the many other things that start following this marriage and you start to see the marriage becoming a fulfillment you find a certain joy in it you get my point your father might not be taking your mother on a date every night. It doesn't mean that they don't love each other because for you, take yourselves on a, on a date every day. No. Maybe some of you are still undergoing that process. You get my point? Eh? But at one point, it, I'm not saying it's wrong for him not to take or that it's right for him to take. That doesn't even matter at a particular point. At a particular point, they start to look from without and start looking within. And actually, it thinks that you actually married someone within. It are you who look outside. I warn you. Do you understand what I'm saying? Because outside can be very what? Yes, the body at one particular point can take its shape until you can't even recognize this person anymore. You you understand what I'm saying? Women know. You give birth to one child and your whole system changes. One! (laughs) First born. You don't feel like the girl who used to run quickly when you're chasing a cat. The things change, you get it? But... As marriage continues, people start to look inwardly. The outward love dies and the inward love grows. And as the inward love grows, they also start to love outwardly, but because of the inward, right? They don't love outward to love inward. No, they love inward to love outside. They love from within out. They don't love from without in, yeah? Yet, in the usual things of, of our human feelings, many people say, ah, yeah, when I saw this woman, I said, you know, what did you see? You get my point? You saw the physical her. You get my point? That is why many men, sometimes when they get to the point of marriage, some people question the women they marry. Hey, but that guy. Why? Because some of you, you see outside. Some people see inside. That inward, eh? incorruptible, gentle, and mixed spirit. You see, but I've given you an example of marriage that certain things die to give life to certain things. And if relationships don't understand that in the process when certain things are dying, some people can actually lose their relationship to think that there's something wrong with them. No, that shake-up is trying to kill the body so the, the life, the germ will come out. You understand what I'm saying? Nothing lives except it truly dies. Praise the Lord Jesus. Nothing lives except it truly what? Multiplies. Yes. Look at the Christ. Jesus went on the cross. Some people don't know that the crucifixion of Christ was a bigger plan. There was no way he could rescue you. There was no way he he would be the ultimate propitiation. There was no way he would bring many sons to glory except he submitted himself to the same principle. If anything, Jesus would have just come, preached the gospel, caused people to believe, and then we all believed and went to heaven. But even the Son of God submitted himself to this principle. He submitted himself. To this principle because he knew that without death there can no be no true multiplication that means this is a principle that is timeless in heaven and earth it is a constant that nothing leaves and multiplies except it die first 
Jesus is on the cross. You understand? As the body is giving way to death, the spirit within, the germ, the life within him, he says, my father, I commit my spirit into thine hands. And the Bible says that he breathed his last, bowed his head, and then he died. Jesus died. But the Christ, the spirit of Christ, was handed in the hand of God the Father. And when that spirit of Christ was handed in the hand of God the Father, what happens? He took on a celestial form and went in hell. Hallelujah. And the Bible says, and he dismantled all the principalities. He, he hit them. He defeated all of them. The Bible says, triumphing over all of them. He shook them a note. I love the translation that says he shook them a note. That means he hit them to nothingness. He destroyed them to nothingness. And he made a show of them openly, triumphing over all of them, the principalities, the powers. What happens is when he makes triumph over these things, he ascends. Right? In the heavenly places. And then he comes. And then he gives men gifts. Prophets, pastors, all of us. And these gifts are as a result of this death. And that is how salvation comes. If a man confesses that Jesus is Lord, if a man believes in his heart that he died and rose again, salvation comes to that man. And consequently, that man starts to live a life of Christ. But when that multiplication takes place, uh, the Bible says... That person, that Jesus, comes in your heart. The same Jesus who was one on the cross. He comes inside your heart. You understand? And when he comes inside your heart, you and him are one. This is love made perfect that we might have, uh, what? Confidence on that day. For as he is, so are we in this world. In him we live, move, and have our own being. He abideth in us. The scriptures are clear on this. This is uh, the mystery uh, hid from the ages. Pastor now revealed Christ in us. The hope of glory. When you receive Jesus Christ, that same germ, life, that was in the Christ gets inside you. That's why he says in Romans 8, the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead resides in you. He shall give your mortal bodies life. You understand that? Your mortal bodies, life. That's the same spirit. That life in you. The principle of life is in you. The Bible says the principle of life abideth in you permanently. You understand what I'm saying? You can live a normal life like any other person and then have normal results and die a normal person. Even with this life in the inside of you until you understand what it means to die. Praise God. Until you understand what it means to what? To die. Now, let's continue in John where he was. In verses 25, he says, He, listen, that loveth his life, the word there for life is suke, right? The, the life of man. That life which was breathed in Adam when he breathed in him the breath of life and he became a living soul. He says, and he that loveth his life shall lose it. And he that hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto life eternal. Are you hearing me? And the next verse says, if any man serve me, comma, let him follow me. Semicolon. Where I am, there shall also my servant be. If any man serve me, he will my father honor. Somebody say amen. What does the Bible mean when it says hate? He that hateth his life. He that loveth his life. Is God saying, you wake up in the morning and hate yourself. I hate myself. No, no, no. You understand what I'm saying? Of course, I want to give the principle of life because if I do that, you're, go you're going to understand how it works in the business, at your job, in your everything, right? When he says, he that loveth his life shall lose it, and he that hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto life eternal. What does he mean when he says to hate your life? Give me the Amplified. The Bible says, anyone who loves his life loses it, but anyone who hates his life in this world will keep it to life eternal. He says, whoever has, listen, no love for, no concern for, no regard for, his life here on earth, but despises it. The Bible says he preserves his life forever and ever. How do I despise my life? You understand? Do I despise my life by waking up in the morning and I don't brush my teeth <laughs> because I'm despising my life? Do I put on funnily and then come to church working anyway? You know some people, some people have misread the scripture. 
You understand? Back in the day when we were growing up, there was a woman they, in the church they used to call Sister Tagolola. It went <laughs> in the body of Christ where I was raised. There was a sister they used to say, or, they, when they, there was a, there's a sister I'm looking for. They say, Ona Tagolola, this one who doesn't iron. You understand? Eh? The, so there was a sister, she was known for not ironing her clothes because she hates her life. You understand what I'm saying? We're not saying don't, don't comb your hair, don't wash yourself, don't clean yourself. No, no, no. Your body is the temple of God. You understand what I'm saying? And the Bible says, and my temple shall be magnificent. Nyirida, praise God. Dress to kill. You might not have the most expensive clothes, but iron your clothes. Hallelujah. Some people, they just wake up and then they come to church. And it's worse for women. Praise God. You find a girl and you say, eh, hey, is she born again? Praise the Lord Jesus. No, clean yourselves. People bathe. Praise God. But when he says despise, do not regard, do not. This is what he means. And I'm going to give you a few principles to help you understand what he means. Okay? When you receive Jesus Christ, how many of you know you were bought by a price? It was expensive. How much expensive were you? The life of the Son of God. The life of the Son of God as we know it was put on the line for your salvation. You understand what I'm saying? That's how much God loves you. If you ever get to a point where you doubt the love of God for you, remember what he had to do to get you. Some people say, ah, me, God doesn't love me. Why? Because I'm suffering. No, no, no. Whatever you're going through has nothing to compare with the love he has for you and the glory that shall be revealed while you look not at the things which are seen, for the things that are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Praise the Lord Jesus. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. Somebody shout hallelujah. hallelujah. Now, one of the underlying principles of a man who understands what it means to him, despises life it means that in the back of your head in everything you do you never make yourself central that's the first principle it's not about you praise God it's not about you if you don't get this you will never multiply your business you find a very myopic understanding of people doing business. Oh, you know I'm doing this. I want to do this. I want to get a business. You find a, a young man or a young woman saying, I want to do business. Why? Because I want to, to get enough money and then I buy myself a car, get a house. I feel it's time for me to marry. I think it's time for me to do business. I, you know why I want to do business? Because I, 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 I need a job. You know, my father told me that if, if I don't get a job, I'm going to be in trouble. I need a house because, you know, I'm tired of renting. I need a car because, you know, I'm tired of sitting on board. I, was, I need this i need this i need this for my business i need to meet this consultant i need to get this deal in i need to do this why for me the more central you are the more you frustrate the spirit of multiplication multiplication works when your eyes start to open to understand the responsibility that comes with everything you will receive in this life and to always know in the back of your mind it is not about you it was never about you. It should never be about you. There is a man trying to do a business in the world because he's troubled about the need, the problem existing in that time. You understand what I'm saying? And there's another man trying to do business in that time because he's, he's simply trying some, to get some to do. You understand what I'm saying? Let me give you an example. There's a teacher... Who went to school and then he's trying to probably his dream is to build a school because he wants to make money out of the school and there's a teacher who went to school because he hurts when he sees people who are not knowledgeable he his heart or her heart is in making sure that people get to know there's a passion that drives why they go to school they go to study they go to do teaching practice they feel it's a calling on their lives 
such people who enter education with a calling in their lives, many of them don't die teachers. They die directors of schools. Hello? But then there's another one who said they failed history, and then they failed the code, then they got the two principal passes, and then they didn't have money to go to the university, then they were given four options, and then they settled for the easier one. Let me do education. Four. You understand? And then they did education, and then they found themselves doing teaching practice. Then before you know that, they got contacts and good deals. Then they started working. Yes, they are working as teachers for the money, but they are not working as teachers because they are called. You understand what I'm saying? That kind of man cannot multiply. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, did not come to die so everybody would say, you see, that's me, that's Jesus. You understand what I'm saying? He didn't boast. The Bible says the Son of Man did not come to be ministered to, but he came to minister. It doesn't mean that men did not minister to him, but his sole purpose was not to be ministered to. The Son of God, the Bible says, did not come to seek glory, but he came to give the Father glory. He had a purpose. He had an intention. He had a, a, an, 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 he had, he had a drive in his spirit. He, he saw the end of you and I sitting today on Sunday, loving on each other, answering questions on germination. And he felt it was that he would die for you. Jesus did not have himself in mind. If he did, he would not have come on earth. He would not have brought many sons to glory. You see him weeping in the garden of Gethsemane. He said, God, if it be possible, take this cup of suffering off me. The human self considered himself and he felt sorry for himself. Listen, he was innocent. He knew no sin. He was the son of Mary. He had a mother who was going to wake up tomorrow and imagine for a moment that the world had crucified her son who knew nothing, who had not done anything wrong except to heal the sick, cast out devils, cleanse the lepers and raise the dead. He had brothers who he was raised with, he used to laugh and play with. He imagined the time where he was going to die early at the age of 33. He was never going to have an opportunity to have children like anybody else was. I mean, he, he had many thoughts as a man, as a man, as a man. So some people don't know that even though he was 100% God, he was 100% man too. He was 100% man too. He had feelings like you and I have feelings. He was tempted in all ways. He was hungry. He went to the toilet. He had a bath like anybody else. Praise the Lord. So the human self kicks in when he's almost fulfilling purpose. And he says, Father, if this be possible, take this cup of suffering off me. Take it. But if it be thine will, he submitted to the Father. Then let thine will be what? Done. It's not about me, God. It's about you. What happens? The Son of God purchased our eternal salvation. This scripture spoken of in John 12, 24. He was about a week before he dies. It was just a few days to his crucifixion. This was a man who was going to die. And look at his meditations. He's, he's of course scared to go on the cross. But see the meditation in his head. I have to die to bring multiplication. 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 The Jews come, the Greeks come to see him. But even as the Greeks come to see him, his mindset is still there. I have to die to bring multiplication. I want to bring many sons to glory. I want to bring glory. I want to bring healing. I want to bring understanding. I want to bring revelation. I want to bring peace that passes all understanding. I want to bring joy. I want to bring victory. I want men to triumph. I want men to have life. Joy unspeakable, full of glory. This is what I want for men. This is, this is, this, the, the Greeks have come to see you, except a seed is put in the ground. It abideth alone. But if it dies, it brings forth much fruit. His meditations were around his death. And he ignored the things that were going to happen at that present moment. And he started putting his mind on the end of the things that he meditated in his heart. That's a person going to multiply. You stop looking at the self. You stop looking at yourself. You stop looking at yourself. You get out of your selfish way and start looking what I'm doing. Is it going to benefit people? Who is it going to benefit? To what end is it? Is it to my profit? Listen, when your eyes go on men to benefit people and things, amazingly, you don't worry about your benefit. Your profit comes automatically. Look at the most successful people on the face of the earth. Simple practicability. When Bill Gates was developing uh, Windows, he wasn't developing it as a selfish tool. No. Read his story. He was curious to see mankind find solutions through computers the easiest way. 
And that's how Microsoft came through. He was a solution giver. And he was not trying to make this selfish. It wasn't about him. It was about what... You look at the most successful people in the world. They have been solutions. But there's a difference between giving a solution for a selfish interest and giving a solution for a selfless interest. That's the difference between a man who despises his life and a man who loves his life. If you're in need for you, in spite of the fact that it looks like a solution to men, it will die. How many of you understand what I'm saying? Let me tell you why it dies. Because there's a word called meraki. There's a Greek word called meraki. Meraki is a term in the Greek language that means, for example, you get into a work or something you do huh? and your spirit starts to manifest in that thing. You understand what I'm saying? Meraki, this is a word that modern Greeks often use to describe doing something with your soul, creativity, your love, when you put something of yourself into what you're doing. Putting something of yourself into what you're doing. Now let me explain how Meraki reconciles with this thing I'm saying that you don't have to be selfish. In this instance, when they talk about Meraki, putting something of yourself into a thing, here they are not talking about considering yourself. They are talking about your vision representing in the thing you're doing. They are talking about your heart being in the thing. When they talk about doing something with your soul, with your love, with your passion, okay? They're not talking about considering yourself. They're talking about you doing something with your love, with your soul, with your passion, with, with purpose. That is putting yourself into something. But this is not the selfish thing I'm trying to talk about where you're doing something for you to gain. It's not for your gain, no. It's for your love. It's for the love. It's with, with the creativity of your soul, but it carries a definitive direction, a purpose, and an intention that goes way beyond your selfish pursuit, your selfishness. So Meraki, much as you put the self in the thing, you are not selfish. You're not considering yourself. Meraki is an experience that can only happen when a man has died to self. That's when your true self can be put in a thing. Your true life, the outward dies. Remember the concept back in the day? The outward, the fleshly, the bodily thing dies and the spirit thing starts to come through. I have a passion to preach. You get my point? I read the Bible with that passion. I preach with that passion. You understand what I'm saying? And then I start Fanero. Fanero is not about me. No man in this room can tell me that at any one point I ever begged from you. I've never asked anything from anybody here. But you bless me, thank God. But I've never come to you and I asked you for anything. I don't beg. It's not pride. No, it's just being selfless. I don't beg. There are times I'll probably need something, but there's nobody I'll call and say, please give me. I don't. I have take an opportunity to work with those who have availed themselves on an issue that is needed in the ministry, but I have never imposed myself. I don't impose except somebody has availed themselves according to what I feel is okay and right to my judgment. You understand? Much as I'm preaching on Sunday and every Thursday and doing all these things, it's nothing about me. I am looking at, at you. You understand? When I go in the Bible and I'm reading, I'm reading it so I understand it enough to explain to you. When I get a book and I read it on Sunday, Thursday, I'm not reading it so people say, wow, this apostle is deep. No, I'm doing it so I can give you enough food to become better. This in my heart, the Lord knows, that is why Fanero multiplies. It does multiply because we are centering ourselves around my selfishness. And my Fanero is multiplying because every time I look at myself, I feel that it's not about me. Even the revelation that come in my spirit, I know that it is not for me, it is for you. When I pray, I'm praying for you. When I'm reading the Bible, I'm reading it for you. I put my love in the thing. I put this myself there. I will come in that hospital and visit you. I'll come at your home and pray with you. I'll come on your children's weddings. I come on your birthday parties. I come on your graduations. Do you come to mine? How many can I have? 
You understand? We are on your weddings. We preach in your bridal showers. We preach in your room, whatever. We preach in your busikis. We are there when you lose people. We are there when we are happy. We are there when you when you are sad. We are there when you are disrespectful. We are there when you are respectful. We are there when you regard us. We are there when you not regard us. You understand? You call us at midnight. You send us text messages at two. You send text messages at three. You call me at six because you assume I've been sleeping from eight p.m. You understand? And some of you don't even have any regard for us. But we don't complain. We still serve and are available for you. You understand what I'm saying? But because it's not about the self, it's not about me. You understand? I do it because of God. And because of what, what, what He has showed me is my purpose, my part in the Lord in the gospel. But that said, it's one thing if I don't understand my purpose, then I can't multiply my feeling my spirit on you if it's not selfless a selfish spirit cannot multiply itself on other men a selfless spirit multiplies itself on other men remember when moses was serving the children of israel you remember god says get 70 men and i shall get of your spirit and i shall put it upon them and they shall make your burden lighter why does they were full they were good men they loved god they had the holy spirit but he got the spirit of moses and put it on 70 men and those men served when you see people serving boot trucks in chairs do you know why people ask how fanero because when people start serving in fanero it blows you from the richest person in the ministry to the poorest so to speak that's literal not truth they all serve god Today, if you're here and you're not serving, eh? you're selfish. You're cheating us. It's about you. You come, receive the gospel, go home, receive the gospel, go home. And then after you want God somehow to multiply your business. You want to go for what? For your glory? No. We want the richest businessman to have reason to be the richest businessman in the world. So when you say that I'm the richest businessman, everybody says, yeah, this, this guy knows God. He, it's for the glory of God. Be rich for the glory of God. Be the best engineer for the glory of God. Be the best doctor for the glory of God. Be the best, the best consultant in the world for the glory of God. Be the best preacher for the glory of God. Be the best statistician for the glory of God. Be the best, the best as you are for the glory of God. Everything that you'll amass, the master's degree, the PhDs that you're going to have, you can use them selfishly and then get a job of $3,000 and they pay you that monthly and then you buy a house and a car, have children and then die no more. All that can be used for the glorification of the kingdom of God. Imagine you earning all of that money and then they find you ferrying chairs. You'll minister to people more than you'll ever. A multiplication effect will be on your life because you're not doing business or anything in your life for yourself. You're doing it for the glory of God and the expansion of his kingdom and the knowledge of his name. That's the server of his knowledge by us in every place. That is why he causes us to triumph. The scripture says that he might make manifest the server of his knowledge by us in every place. Don't ever be too deep to speak about Jesus. Don't ever be too anointed not to multiply the spirit that is at work within you. Meraki, put yourself in the thing. That is why some people are not, cannot be successful businessmen. Because you don't have a passion for it. You just have a business idea of it. You don't have a passion for it. Yourself, your vision cannot be infused in it. Sometimes I go to the grounds late at night to make sure that the chairs are okay. I go to inspect lights at midnight. Apostle Grace, you understand what I'm saying? No, it's not intended. No. When you love something, when you have a passion for something, you will want to know about that thing. You understand what I'm saying? But again, it's not about you. Even though you are in it, it's not about you. Even though you've put yourself in it, it's not about you. You understand what I'm saying? It's not about you. It's not about you. It's not about you. It's not about your salary. Praise God. It's not about your pay. No, no, no. No, 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 no. That is why when the Bible says the race is not to the swift, neither. When you understand how it means to be selfless and put yourself into a thing, believe me, it can appear any way. It can appear as beautiful as you see it. You understand what I'm saying? Beauty, glory, many of these things. There are many things like beauty. These things are relative. 
That's why they say beauty lies in the eyes of the beholder. For you only look and think about women and men. No, no, this goes beyond. The way people see something beautiful is different from the way you might be seeing beauty. You understand what I'm saying? The way people see something wonderful is not, might not be the way you see wonder. But when all can agree with your definition of beauty, you understand what I'm saying? When all can agree with your definition of beauty, when all can agree with your definition of knowledge, when all or many can agree with your definition of understanding, then you're somewhere in the spirit. You're somewhere in the spirit. There's a Greek word called kalopsia. Kalopsia means that certain things appear more beautiful than they actually are. But what makes them more beautiful than they actually are is your ability to make them beautiful by the vision you carry and the passion and the love. And while they, they are more beautiful than they actually are, they later become beautiful as they ought to be because God is working through you. But this is the process where the self dies you. You have to stop doing stuff for you. You have to stop raising children for you. You have to stop marrying for you. You have to stop having somebody in the house because you want to be minister too. You have to stop being selfish. It's not about you. Hannah went to God. She didn't tell him to give me a child. No. She told him, give me a man child. She knew what she wanted. She was going to give birth to the, to the judge of Israel. The man who will pour oil to the first king and the second king. The man who will give judgment and direction to Israel. She didn't go to God barren and say, I want a child. She wasn't desperate for a child. She wanted a male child. She told God, give me a male child, a man child. Then I will give him unto you all the days of his life. And there shall no razor come upon his head. I'll make him a Nazarite. That's a person with a vision. When you're asking for babies and you're barren, don't ask for a baby. No. Ask for the specific baby. When you want to get married, ask for a specific woman. Ask for a specific man. Ask for a specific business. Ask for a specific career. Follow a specific path. Serve in a specific organization. Serve in a specific structure. Be specific. Purpose. Put your heart in it, put in it, but without the intention, it's not about you. Samuel was not for the benefit of Hannah to also wake up and tell Penina, oh, I used to have children. No. You don't even come to church anymore for you. You don't win souls for you. When we tell you collect the ten, some of you, you listen to these instructions and just throw them out and then you make yourselves busy. In other things, you're cheating us. You're cheating us. I am here and available for you. That's why you're here. Fanera is here because I'm here. You understand? We have given you enough. Extend it too. Don't be selfish. We don't give you mysteries only for you to drive nice cars and have good houses. They're not for you. They're to the intent that your wife will change. Your husband will change. Your children will change. Your family relatives will change. The friends next to you will have effects. Stop being selfish. It's not about you. It's not about you. Don't come to service anymore because some of you are even too proud to preach Jesus to someone. Yet we are standing before you every Sunday. You think we enjoy standing up? No, we don't. No, 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 we don't. But we do it because of you. So we do it because of you. Now the ministry is going to grow. And I'm going to get to a point where I can't meet all of you. Don't be selfish with me. Allow me to meet other people too, like I gave you time. You know, we still have mentalities. Oh, me, that man is not my pastor. How can he take care without calling me? Listen, I don't need to call you to be your pastor. I just need to speak to you things you understand. Because I can call you and be Kano. I can call you and stay Kano. You understand what I'm saying? There's a silly thing I've heard in the body of Christ that it's not scripture even. It's not even scripture. Listen, I, if you have a man of God, when I, call, when I say it's a personal relationship, I'm not meaning you call him. You having a relationship with your man of God means that you share in the fellowship of revelation. What he speaks defines you. I don't need to call you on Sunday. I don't need to call you on Tuesday. 
what I need is for you to always sit in a meeting and every time I'm speaking, you feel I'm speaking to you. That's how you know I'm your man of God. Some people have chejo. For them, if you don't call them, I'm not a member. If you don't, if you don't do this, I'm not a member of that church. How can the pastor not care for me? Listen, how much can I care for you except give you the word? How much can I care for you? Do you know the Bible hasn't called us to take care of men? The Bible has called us to care for men. Not to take care of. There's a difference. God has not called us to pamper you into babies. How will the ministry grow when I have to call everyone? Oh, when will you ever stand without a phone call? Okay, go to a smaller church where they will call you. Then it also grows big. Then they stop calling you. Then you go to another one. Then it also grows big. Then they stop calling you. Then you go to another one. Until the day you grow and come back. We shall be waiting for you. Praise God. It's your time. Somebody shout hallelujah. It's never about you. It's never about you. Always remember. I'm not doing this business for me. I'm not building this ministry for me. I'm not worshipping for Apostle Grace. I'm not singing for Pastor Zach. It is about God. It's not about me. I'm not doing this job because I want to be paid this much. No. I'm doing this job because I have been called. Praise God. Never feel that you're not cared for because someone is not calling you. You don't need a phone call to know someone cares. You just need the right word. Because that now means God cares about me enough to teach me what I needed. That's true care. Stop being carnal. Everybody submitted to me must serve somewhere. Praise God. I don't care whether you're the richest person in the world. I don't care whether you're, you're the best doctor in the world the best engineer in the world, the richest businessman in the world, you must serve somewhere. This ministry is not about us. Praise God. Serve the Lord. Push yourself to find something in the ministry to do. Get your ten. Write a list if they fail, win others. Finish the hand. Tell God, I want you ten people. Because the Bible says the list shall have a thousand. At least we want in 10 years for the least person in this ministry. In 10 years, at least the least person in this ministry will have won a thousand souls. And the small one, a nation. And the greatest, a generation. And a continent. Our vision is an awakening. It's not just to preach on Sunday. No, win souls. Get somebody to church. Get somebody on Thursday. Bring them and say, come and pray. Get them CDs. Do you know the joy of looking at your fruit? You want somebody back. You look back and say, this was, this was me. I did this for God. I did this for God. Stop being selfish. Some of you, all you need are mysteries. You're just, you're just looking for mysteries. For your next job. For your next car. For what? That is why you ask and, and receive not. Because you ask a miss. You want to consume on your own lusts. That's why God is not hearing your prayers. You've believed God for a breakthrough financially, for a job. You fail to get that deal. Contracts, you're chasing contracts. You look like someone who chases, you're chasing, but nothing is coming through. Maybe it's because it's always and has always been about you. Since you're free and you don't have a job, why don't you start hunting for God? Why don't you win souls for God? Why don't you start visiting up your friends for tea just to tell them about God? Some will understand, some will not. But you must carry somebody. Otherwise you're cheating the rest. Who are doing the same thing. It's not about you. Praise God. Your business is not about you. It's for the Lord. Even you, you're not for yourself. Praise God. Do you know why marriages are failing? People are selfish. You're centering around you. What you want. And your appetite. Praise God. Speak to God.
history tells it belongs to you, my God. Alpha and the man of love. that you'll truly multiply I pray that may God cause you to multiply I pray that everything you do will and should not be about you until the you dies you cannot multiply may God work through you mighty in Jesus name say amen the message you have just heard was brought to you by Fenero Ministries International for more information, contact us on telephone number 041-466-4291 or email us at fenerocompala at gmail.com. You can also find us on the web at www.fenero.org. Or better still, feel free to join us every Thursday for our weekly fellowships at Uma Multipurpose Hall from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. You can also catch the live stream at livestream.com slash Fenero. Venero, make manifest.